moving on, you have a little family of sunspots up here in the northern hemisphere, and then you'll notice the image looks a little bit grainy. That's actually granulation. It's not a low resolution image. It's an, it's an actual physical structure indicative of subsurface convection, essentially boiling underneath the surface of the sun. And that granulation matrix changes in time. Things get a, a lot more interesting though if we switch from visible light to ultraviolet light. So here we're looking at a composite image of three different uh, EUV wavelengths. And now we're looking at light not so much from the photosphere, from the surface, we're looking at light from the sun's extended atmosphere, it's corona. No connection to coronavirus, other than both look vaguely crown-like. Um, the temperatures we're seeing, as indicated by the fact that we're looking at it with UV light, are much more extreme. In the lower part of the corona, you're typically seeing 100,000 degrees Celsius. By the time you get to the upper corona, you're getting well above a million degrees Celsius in some regions. In contrast to the visible light image, you see much larger and more dynamic structures. That little family of sunspots is giving rise to this huge active region uh, of tangled magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields are indicated, they're actually traced out by the plasma and you can see them forming loops and streams inside the corona. And at these temperatures, you're looking mostly at fully ionized gas. If we step back a bit even more, um, we begin to see the origins of the solar wind in the corona. Uh, this is a compo uh, composite visible light image of the 2017 ecl uh, solar eclipse. Um, and we see, you know, as we zoom out here now, we're looking at light actually being scattered from the sun off of the electrons in the solar wind. You start to see um, the spatial and temporal structure on much larger scales. Um, you see at the polar regions these nice distinct streams that are sort of spreading out, mushrooming out from the poles. <clears throat> then closer to the equatorial region, you see those loops giving rise to what are known as helmet streamers because they have that characteristically pointed arch shape. Um, also coming out of, this, out of the corona. In the corona, the plasma is both heated, right, from that low surface temperature, or relatively low surface temperature of 5,500 degrees Celsius, up to hundreds of thousands or millions of degrees Celsius. And it's also accelerated to supersonic speeds. And this material eventually flows out into deep space, and that is the solar wind. Hey, Ben. Yes. Uh, a question about the choices of color in the in some of the previous slides. Uh, like this one. Bill, do you want to unmute and clarify your question? Yeah, the very first image of the sun you said was at uh, 4,500 angstroms. That's uh, blue light. Why is the sun green? Um, I honestly have no idea. Uh, this is so the, this is the official color scheme that was chosen by the Solar Dynamics Observatory uh, Advanced Imaging Array, AIA. Um, I downloaded this image right off of their website. And I know that they use this, and it's a really good question. I know that they use this particular color uh, for this filter. They have, let's say they produce like half a dozen different um, filter images, and you can just go on their website and download them, by the way. Um, strictly speaking, it should be black and white, but I don't know why they chose to make it yellow. I never really thought about that, but you're right. Yeah. I, um, I wonder if it's because people think of the sun as being yellow. I, that would be my guess, honestly. Um, and maybe they wanted the blue here so that they could use the RGB for the three color composite UV image. Uh, because they also have another band that's magenta. Uh, that one I believe is also UV and it shows up as magenta. So it may have just been what was left over after they'd already used red, green, and blue. And I think they go with that color scheme, those colors um, just to make it quicker to identify what color band they're looking at, since with each those, these wavelengths are not chosen at random. They correspond to specific spectral lines of specific um, ions. So I think like these are some of these are corresponding to like particular iron lines. Um, 
so that you can tell something about the temperature uh, by looking at the color that you're being presented with. You can, with a little bit of, there's a little bit of black magic that goes into it, but you can figure out, at least get a decent estimate of what the spectral temperature is, uh, which is how we figured out in the first place that the corona is so hot. Okay, great. So, sorry, that's, I don't have a very satisfying answer, but uh, are there any other questions up? That's all for now. Thanks, Ben. It's all good. Okay. So, solar wind extends out into deep space and it goes out pretty far, pretty much. Uh, so, this defines the region of space known as the heliosphere. So that's the region of space where that is filled up or dominated by plasma flowing out from the sun. You'll see in this um, artist rendering, uh, the, uh, the planets of the solar system shown here, roughly to scale with the termination shock. The termination shock is when the solar wind's outflow goes from being supersonic, it drops suddenly to being subsonic, filling up the region known as the heliosheath, and then finally the heliopause where the plasma from the sun runs into the plasma of the interstellar medium. Uh, we don't actually know the shape of these structures all that well. The termination shock is probably round-ish, although it could be very uh, ellipsoidal. Uh, the heliopause, we really have no idea what that's like. I've seen, it may have a tail, it may not. I've seen some models suggesting that it may actually be crescent-shaped with like a double tail, sort of like a croissant. Um, there's a lot of speculation there. And for size scale, you're looking at the distance from the sun to the heliopause at the nose, about 100 astronomical units. So just sort of a quick comparison, um, just to compare the solar wind at one AU from the sun, so roughly Earth's distance, to just the conditions of dry air in a normal room, uh, like a home or an office. So unlike dry air, the solar wind is almost completely ionized. It's predominantly composed of hydrogen with a significant fraction of helium versus the nitrogen and oxygen in air. Um, the real difference, uh, the dramatic difference I think is the density. Um, if you're looking at a cubic centimeter of air, you're talking about over 10 to the 19 molecules in every cubic centimeter of air. Uh, in contrast, you have about five ions in the solar wind per cubic centimeter on average. Um, it's a very, very, very low density material, though it still carries a significant amount of energy because of its speed. It's moving along at on average, about a million miles per hour, literally, 500 kilometers per second. And that speed is substantially faster than the speed of sound in that material. So whereas winds on Earth are typically well below the speed of sound through air, the solar wind is, has a Mach number, its outflow has a Mach number, the ratio of its speed to its sound speed of about 10 or so, although all those numbers are pretty variable in the solar wind. You have this energetic pl magnetized plasma coming out of the sun and heading to Earth, and it is going to have some pretty dramatic effects on Earth, and especially Earth's magnetic field, which shields us from a lot of the, the full brunt of the solar wind. Um, the interaction of the solar wind with the Earth system provides, gives rise to what's known as space weather. Um, one of the more lovely effects of space weather is uh, the aurora, the northern and southern lights. But during more dramatic space weather events, you can have some significant damage to power grids and spacecraft. This has happened before. Uh, disruptions to communication and navigation, and also uh, uh, extra ionizing radiation being produced, uh, in, especially in the polar regions and above the denser layers of the atmosphere. I don't think it's widely known uh, that the Center for Disease Control actually classifies um, airline pilots and flight attendants as radiation workers. They're in the same category as nuclear power plant workers uh, because especially when you make repeated regular trips over uh, the polar regions, you're being exposed to higher levels of radiation. So there's special protocols, for example, for pilots and flight attendants who 
might be pregnant or are pregnant uh, to reduce their exposure to that radiation. Um, the most dramatic effects are geomagnetic storms. Typical timeline for geomagnetic storms is it begins with a major solar flare happening uh, at back at the sun. And flares often, not always, but the major flares tend to produce some form of coronal mass ejection, an extra poof of high density, high speed plasma coming out in the uh, solar wind. When that poof reaches Earth, it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field to give rise to a geomagnetic storm. So now it comes time for the video uh, that Jeff mentioned earlier. So you can switch away. I'll play it for those of you who don't have it um, and start playing that video right about, let's, let's do right about now. So this is an animation produced by Goddard Space Flight Center Media Studios. So the little streaks are representative of particles in the solar wind. So the CME is a denser region of particles coming out of the sun toward the earth. So now that wall of particles has reached the earth. It, most of them are being deflected by earth's magnetic field, which is being compressed by the flux of particles, giving it that tail. And some of those particles are getting trapped on the magnetic field lines of earth are getting directed toward the Earth's poles, which are producing the aurora and particle energization. So. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I'm particularly interested in the history of the discovery of the solar corona and the solar wind. Um, so I thought I'd put in a little bit of that here is a little bit of that information here because I think it's an interesting story. It's, I, I find it fascinating to learn how we came to understand things in science. I think it's very instructive for doing even modern research. So typically the oldest general, the oldest pretty clear description of the solar corona comes from, to us from Plutarch. Certainly people had observed the sun before Plutarch, um, people had observed uh, for eclipses and written about them, and we have descriptions of eclipses uh, long before Plutarch. But he was the first one to really write down with some clarity that even during a total solar eclipse, a kind of light is visible about the rim. He's just, he seems to be here describing the corona back in 90 CE, um, which once you block out the photosphere, it becomes visible. There is, though, one other possibility that I've come across that some scholars believe is an even older description of the solar corona, though it's a bit more vague. And that one comes from China in a description of the 1302 BCE solar eclipse and comes to us from a piece of uh, oracle bone. These were ox bones, or in this case, a turtle shell used for divination through pyromancy. The bone would be, we would have an inscription written on it, and then it would be tossed into a fire, and then the fracture pattern would be used to uh, divine an answer to your question. And this piece of bone has a description of the eclipse, uh, and then goes on to include this little passage here in red, uh, which in modern Chinese characters would look like this, and could be translated as three flames ate the sun and a big star appeared. Um, and what, and I'll for, I should first thank uh, one of my students, Yan Wen Wang, for some translation assistance because I am not at all fluent in Chinese, uh, modern or ancient. But what some scholars believe that this inscription mean is referring to is it's referring to, and here we have an image of an eclipse from the India eclipse from 1898. Uh, the three flames may refer to the coronal streamers, those helmet streamers that you see in the corona. And the big star could refer to a bright star or perhaps more likely a planet such as Venus that would suddenly become visible during a total eclipse. So again, it's a little speculative but it kind of makes sense. Uh, it's not an open and shut case, but it's certainly tantalizing and it's a very poetic description of a solar eclipse. 
So certainly by the uh, 1800s, it was clear that the sun had an atmosphere, a corona. Uh, in, but there was less of a, it was not at all clear that anything other than light was coming out of the sun. Uh, one big indication of that came actually in 1859 in what's known as the Carrington event. And it began with a solar flare that was observed simultaneously and independently by two uh, British astronomers, Richard Hodgson and Richard Carrington. And they described, uh, they were both happened to be studying a cluster of sunspots and uh, through a projected image of the sun. And they, in the words of Richard Hodgson, uh, noticed a brightening, a, like a very bright, a very brilliant star of light um, and with streaks um, from the edges of the adjacent spots. It lasted for some five minutes, which is actually quite long for a solar flare. So it's a pretty big one. And it just so happened that that flare's coronal mass ejection was directed at Earth, and it produced the largest geomagnetic storm in recorded history a few days, less than a day later, actually. Uh, it was so bright, it was so intense that the, um, the aurora, the northern lights, the aurora borealis, were visible from the Caribbean. And even the New York Times covered it in rather poetic language. Uh, soon after sunset, the streamers, which mark every appearance of the aurora, were visible in the north. As the twilight deepened, the merry dancers ventured from their hiding places and played along the horizon as though su successive sheets of impalpable flame were sweeping over the sky. Um, it was really, you know, why don't they teach uh, journalists that in journalism school anymore, you know? It's a pity. Um, Nobody was quite sure what was going on. They, the scientists knew about the aurora, but what it causes it, well, they had a little bit of a 19th century snark in here. Um, what is the origin of this remarkable phenomenon? The ancients asked the question and the moderns reply by repeating the interrogation. The most popular theory attributes it to electricity, but that agent has been made responsible for everything which men did not know how to account for otherwise. I just imagine this, curmudgeonly uh, journalist complaining about that newfangled electricity. Uh, they didn't have much in the way of electronics back then. They did have telegraph systems that were disrupted for days following this. There were accounts of sparks flying out of telegraph machines and wires fusing together. Um, today, if a, something like the Carrington event happened, it would be devastating to our modern electrical systems. And there's a lot of discussion as to how to best mitigate and prevent that damage, should something like that happen again. The Carrington event, as dramatic as it was, wasn't an open shut case for the idea that there's stuff coming out of the sun. The real clear indication of that actually came from comet tales which have been observed since antiquity to point away from the sun. They aren't like a debris trail per se. They seem to point more or less away from the sun. And there tend to be two of them. One that we now know to be primarily composed of gas, the other primarily composed of dust. Uh, Johannes Kepler uh, theorized using the then in vogue corpuscular theory of light to suggest that maybe pressure from sunlight was creating this uh, the tails of comets. Um, it turns out that so sun pressure accounts for the dust tail. It's the same phenomenon that gives us a solar sail. But our modern understanding of light just makes it clear that there's not enough pressure on the gas itself to account for the gas tail. That is due to the outflow of plasma from the sun. Uh, Christian Berkeland, a Norwegian uh, geophysicist, was probably the first to proposed that charged particles were coming out of the sun based on his studies of the aurora. His theory was widely dismissed and sadly he died not long after that, never seeing the widespread acceptance of his theory. That really didn't come until the 1950s. Um, first, the work of a German physicist Ludwig Biermann. Uh, he did some calculation showing that, well, okay, if the gas tail is being caused by an outflow from the sun, that outflow would have to be about 500 kilometers per second in order to account for the structure of the tail. Um, at about the same time, Sidney Chapman 
uh, was look, doing some calculations based on what they knew about the corona at the time, and he realized that given the high temperatures of the corona, it would be extremely conductive, both electrically and especially conductive of heat. Uh, the solar corona, it turns out, is actually more electrically conductive than copper, um, which is remarkable for such a low density material. And it really is the high temperature of that material that allows for it. It was finally then the real breakthrough came with Eugene Parker. Gene Parker put these pieces together and realized, wait, if the corona is as hot as we observe it to be through spectral measurements, there's no way that its pressure could be contained. It couldn't be a static atmosphere the way Earth's is that just sort of sloshes around the planet. No, 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 it had to be, the only way to relieve that pressure is through an explosive supersonic outflow from the corona. Submitted his paper for publication and it was rejected by two referees. He appealed it to the editor, um, Chandrasekhar, uh, and Chandrasekhar was like, okay, give it a shot. Fortunately for Gene Parker, he was writing at the dawn of the space age. And he didn't have to wait long for a confirmation of his theory. Uh, that first came with the Luna series of spacecraft from the Soviet Union, Konstantin Gringos observing, et al. observing um, what they refer to as corpuscular emissions from the sun, indicating ions coming out at high speeds. Uh, this was confirmed a few years later by Marcia Neugebauer et al. Um, I love what she wrote in here, putting uh, solar wind in scare quotes, since it was so new a theory, only a few years old at that point. Um, so, moving up to modern times, we've had since, we've come a long way since the days of Luna and Mariner. Uh, we have now over 60 years of solar wind measurements, spacecraft actually flying into the solar wind to make measurements. And they've covered a wide range of distances from the sun. You see just a selection of those missions arranged here, color-coded based on whether they're completed missions, active, or future missions, um, and organized by the radial distance from the sun for which they have coverage and measurements. Um, you can see it's still over three and a half orders of magnitude, a really impressive collection of measurements. I made this figure for a review paper that I co-authored um, with a couple colleagues, and it was published late last year. There is one important update to it. Back in February, um, Solar Orbiter was at long last launched. Very much, a, a, it's a European Space Agency-led mission with significant NASA partnership. Um, very much a complementary mission to Parker Solar Probe in many ways. A much wider range of imaging instruments and also it goes out of the ecliptic to give more view of the polar regions uh, than Parker Solar Probe. The solar wind is really characterized by just how spatially and how much it varies both spatially and temporally. There's a really complex dynamic uh, flow involved, and just a wide range of processes occurring in the solar wind. To observe them, we primarily use two different um, techniques. The first one is remote observation. So that's basically imaging from afar, using either a ground-based telescope or a space-based one. Um, and this is a really useful and powerful technique for looking at large-scale phenomena and structures, seeing the flow of large-scale streams, even imaging individual coronal mass ejections. Um, most of what I do and most of what the Parker Solar Probe mission is dedicated to is in situ observations, which means that you're putting the probe into the solar wind and directly sampling particles and fields in the plasma. Now, this certainly isn't going to give you a very big picture. It's actually hyper-local. But at the same time, it gives you, it reveals the small scale dynamics, the microphysics of what's going on inside the plasma to a degree that you just simply can't with remote observations. Uh, this image here on the uh, left, which is actually a movie, is a nice, it's a, an interesting special case because it's kind of a hybrid. So this is a movie of images from the stereo spacecraft of a sun grazing comet, Comet Enke. Um, and 
it's remote observations. But what's interesting here is you're seeing the tail actually blowing, the tail of the comet blowing in the solar wind. And the tail is acting like an in situ probe. You're using remote observations of a passive in situ probe. And it's actually tracing out all that structure in the solar wind. It's flapping around as different streams of plasma blow by it as it goes around the sun. I'll just let this movie finish out because it's really cool. And they were actually able to study the turbulent structure of the solar wind through this. It was a really cool study that came out uh, a few years ago. So I mentioned turbulence. Turbulence is one of those extraordinarily ubiquitous phenomena in the universe. It shows up in almost any fluid, uh, neutral fluid, liquid, gas, or plasma. And despite its ubiquity, it's an extraordinarily complex and poorly understood phenomenon. Um, it happens in as mundane places as stirring milk into coffee and to, as grand as dynamics of planetary atmospheres and uh, star forming regions. The basic idea of turbulence is that you have some fluid and that you add kinetic energy at large scales. It could be stirring, the act of stirring your milk into your coffee, or if you're talking about a planetary atmosphere like here, the clouds here on Jupiter as seen in this false color image, uh, the convection that stirs up the atmosphere. This injection of kinetic energy creates swirls, eddies as they're formally called, in the fluid. And these eddies, they don't just sort of sit there, they're moving around. And as they move around, they begin to fragment and shed into smaller and smaller energies. This means your energy is being transferred from large scale kinetic energy to small scale kinetic energy. And this is known as turbulent cascade. The energy is moving from large to small scales. And eventually you end up to smaller and smaller and smaller scales until you run out of scales and you're at the smallest size scale, in which case the energy dissipates into heat. As I said, you can observe this in all sorts of situations, including in Earth's atmosphere. These are measurements from an in situ anemometer, a wind sensor, wind speed sensor, uh, that uh, was on a small project that I was involved with uh, on a balloon, a balloon observations of the stratosphere above Ross Island, Antarctica. And so we're looking here at power spectra of the, uh, in the top panel, the wind speed, the total wind speed in the middle, the horizontal speed, and then in the bottom panel, the vertical flow. And so it's a power spectrum. So those of you who are familiar with Fourier transform, so this is the square of the Fourier transform. Basically what this is telling us is how much power is there as a function of different energy scales, different size scales. So since it's given in frequency, the large scales occur on the left, small scales occur on the right. And you'll notice there's this very nice, it's a log log plot, and there's this nice roughly straight line in all three cases, right? So you have more power at large size scales, and then less power at the smaller size scales because the power is be, the energy is being injected, remember, at the large scales, and it's slowly cascading down into the small scales. And there's a characteristic slope to this, a negative five-thirds slope to this line on, this, on these power law plots, these log-log power law plots. And that negative five-thirds actually, can, you can derive it through some basic dimensional analysis. And that's highly characteristic of turbulence. You see it in liquids, you see it in gases, you even see it in plasmas. It's one of the great hallmarks of turbulence and it crops up all over the place and it can extend from many orders of magnitude in size scale. As I said, you even see it in plasmas, including the solar wind. So this is a composite of in situ data from uh, uh, three different instruments on two different spacecraft um, over what, seven, eight uh, orders of magnitude. So again, this is a power spectrum. So it's power as a function of size scale with large scales on the left, small scales on the right. 
And you'll see there's three distinct regions in terms of size scales. The largest size scales comprise the injection range. This is where the plasma is being stirred by the sun. So we have here a negative one slope to that uh, power law, which is telling us something about not so much the turbulence itself, but these are the individual streams that the sun is sending out, individual streams of solar wind plasma. In the intermediate size scales, you have the inertial range. This is where you have the well-developed turbulent cascade. Energy is flowing from large scales to small scales in an orderly, organized way, conserving energy along the way. Finally, at the small scales, you have the dissipation range. And this is perhaps the most poorly understood region because this is where things get really complex. The solar wind stops behaving as a fluid and you have to actually start thinking about it as a collection of individual particles. And this is where the heating actually occurs. Um, and the uh, mechanics of how that heating occurs are just not well understood at this point. And it's one of the big questions that are with, that's still with us today and what Parker Solar Probe is trying to address. And I think that the two basic questions in heliophysics the Parker Solar Probe is really trying to answer, um, it, it can really be boiled down to two questions, I think. The first one is, how is the corona heated so efficiently? This is called the coronal heating problem. The surface of the sun is relatively cool compared to its atmosphere. There's a massive rise in the plasma temperature by like three orders of magnitude in the solar corona. And we don't understand the mechanics of how this happens. I mean, sure, there's plenty of energy, you're at the sun, but having the energy to do something is quite different from actually achieving it. How does this energy get dumped into the plasma so efficiently? Uh, we have here a plot of uh, observations, a composite of uh, plasma temperature as a function of distance from the sun. And you'll notice back here in the corona, there's a massive spike in the plasma temperature, uh, which is, and again, that's really not understood, the mechanics. We have some ideas. It ha seems to have to do with magnetic fluctuations in the plasma, the magnetic fields and the fluctuations in the plasma, but it's not really understood why. Another piece of this puzzle, which leads us to our second question is, okay, the plasma temperature cools down as the solar wind expands, an expanding gas cools. That's how a compressor works, for example, in an air conditioner. But one problem is it doesn't cool nearly as fast as you would expect for an expanding gas. This, should, this fall off should be much steeper. And so there must be some ongoing heating occurring during the expansion. Where is that energy coming from? And that really is a Big outstanding question, what happens to the solar wind as it expands? There must be some ongoing heating. And the best candidate for that is the strong fluctuations in the solar wind. You have all these eddies and other fluctuate waves and turbulence in the plasma that has kinetic energy that is ultimately being cascaded down to small energy scales and dissipated in the form of heat. But how does that happen? What controls the rate of it happening? And what are the effects of micro scale and macro scale instabilities in this whole process? And so the quest to understand these questions led us to the development of Parker Solar Probe. So a little bit about the mission design, and then I'll get into the first results. I like to start with this photo just because it's such an amazing photo. Um, it's been dubbed Parker meet Parker. So right there you have Eugene Parker. Uh, he is a unique individual in that he has the distinction of being the only living person to have had a NASA spacecraft named after him. Um, Eugene Parker, is, I had the pleasure of meeting him a few years ago. He's just such a wonderful and gracious man. If you ask him about the solar wind and his work in the 50s, he'll say, I, I just had an idea, that's all I did. Um, uh, wonderfully humble. Um, and here he is getting to meet his namesake spacecraft. Uh, there was a naming ceremony for him and um, he gave a short speech and said at the end, 
let's see what lies ahead. And that's now in, in, engraved on a plaque on the side of Parker Solar Probe. What makes part of the Parker Solar Probe mission so unique is its orbit. The spacecraft was launched on a Delta IV Heavy in 2018 from Cape Canaveral, and it's a highly elliptical orbit, and it gradually becomes more and more elliptical through a series of seven gravitational encounters with the planet Venus. Um, this allows the spacecraft to gradually step in its orbit and bring its point of closest approach to the sun, its perihelion, closer and closer to the sun. The first uh, perihelion was at uh, 0.16 AU, and the final perihelion is planned to be uh, less than a 20th of an AU, so 20 times closer to the sun than the Earth. Um, part of the reason this was done was to uh, just operationally, so you have to carry less fuel, but there was also a contingency plan, right? No one has ever gone anywhere close to this uh, anywhere nearly as close to the sun as this, and no one was quite sure how the materials would perform. So with each Venus encounter, you have the option of encounter or not. So if you find that things aren't quite performing optimally and you don't want to get any closer, that remains an option. But we're certainly hoping that that's not going to be the case. And so far, things are looking pretty good. A bit on the instrumentation side, I'm primarily working with data from the sweep instrument sweep. I serve on the uh, science team for that instrument sweep. It's, six, it's three different instruments that are measuring the ions and the electrons in the plasma. Um, I'm also using data and we'll be showing you data from the fields instrument sweep, which measures the electric and magnetic fields. In particular, I'll be showing you data from the fields magnetometers, where you look at the magnetic field of the sun. So a bit about the sweep instruments. I won't go into the technical details of these instruments, so I, I could certainly answer your questions if you have them. Um, the, what the uh, project scientist refers to as the bravest little instrument on the spacecraft is the uh, solar probe cup. It's a Faraday cup. A Faraday cup is a relatively simple plasma instrument. It's an older one, and it's pretty robust. The PI of the sweep instrument sweep calls it the workhorse of plasma physics. Um, it doesn't provide the most detailed measurements of the plasma, but it's a very robust instrument. And it has to be because it bravely peeks out from behind the heat shield, looking directly at the sun, even during encounter. And so if you look at the thermal models that were made, uh, you see that, I don't know, you can see that if you'll notice the scale there, uh, the temperature at closest approach is expected to be over 1600 degrees Celsius. So it's a very impressively thermally designed system uh, on that instrument. So it's not just surviving those temperatures, it's functioning at those temperatures, making measurements of the solar wind. On the back side of the spacecraft are two electrostatic analyzers. These are much more complex instruments in terms of the way they deflect particles and detect them. This allows for much more detailed information about the distribution of particle energies and directions. Uh, but the very sensitive detector technology that makes that possible means that it's, it would be impossible to put on the front of the spacecraft. So they have to be behind the carbon, carbon foam heat shield that protects the rest of the spacecraft so that they can make those measurements. And they rely on the fact that the solar wind is coming around the heat shield in an angle because of the high orbital speed of the Parker Solar Probe. So now, some of the first results. So these are from the Nature Papers that came out late last year um, with the first results. So first, uh, some more uh, power spectra. So this is, again, power as a function of size scale, large scale on the left, small scale on the right. So each of these squiggles is the power spectrum for a different 30 minute sample of Parker Solar Probe data. Um, the cyan curve shows the um, a sample of so-called jet solar wind. So this is highly turbulent solar wind. And the yellow shows the results from, uh, shows a period of relatively quiet, quote, quiet solar wind, just less fluctuations. And in both cases, you see that characteristic negative five-thirds slope that's so typical of well-developed turbulence. Um, there is this little peak here 
in the quiet wind, the yellow curve. Um, that's not entirely understood, but it seems to be an indication of some type of wave or instability acting. We're still trying to piece together exactly what that is. It seems to be some sort of a resonant process in the plasma. So now let's take a look at the particle data. Um, this is an 80 minute time series of data. So it's just a plot of a bunch of different parameters as a function of time. Uh, heliophysicists are notorious for doing these sort of stack plots where you look at how a bunch of different variables vary in time. And they can be a little overwhelming, but I'll try to walk you through the key parts. Um, I'll start at the bottom three plots, plots C, D, and E, and they're showing the three components of the plasma velocity in blue and the magnetic field in red. So you can think of these as the X, Y, and Z components of the velocity and the magnetic field. And you'll notice that they align really, really well. And this is something that's actually seen throughout the solar wind even when you're far away at one AU or many AU away from the sun. Um, this sort of alignment, uh, this, this correlation between the uh, plasma speed and the magnetic, plasma velocity and the magnetic field uh, is known as alphanic fluctuations. Uh, these are fluctuations in the plasma that are likened to uh, you, you pluck a magnetic field line like you would a violin string and it vibrates. And as that magnetic field line vibrates, the particles vibrate with it in a highly correlated fashion. And, they propagate, and this disturbance propagates along the magnetic field line at what's known as the Alphane speed. And it's very common in the solar wind, and it's thought to be intimately connected to the coronal heating problem. So this was not in and of itself unexpected. What was more unexpected is if you look in plot A, the blue curve shows the magnitude of the solar wind velocity, its speed. And it kind of just wiggles around and then there are these sudden jumps, like here's one here, here's one here, here's one here. These spikes, and you'll notice these are massive spikes. You know, you're jumping from 300 kilometers per second up to 400 kilometers per second. That's like a 30 or more percent jump in some of these cases. What's going on here? You certainly see variability, but this is quite dramatic. So if we zoom in on one of these spikes and take a look at it in detail. So these are the same parameters, but it's a much shorter time period. It's only a thousand seconds as opposed to 80 minutes. So here in this gray region is one of those spikes. You look at this blue curve showing the speed and it's down here in the 300, 350 range, and then jumping up to 450, and then just as dramatically jumping down. Well, that's interesting. If we look at the components of the velocity and the magnetic field, they still align. So it's still alphanic. The spike remains alphanic. So it's still some sort of an alphanic fluctuation, a plucking of the magnetic field line. Um, Notably, the magnitude of the magnetic field stays constant. That's in plot B here in the red. So the strength of the magnetic field isn't changing, but its direction is. The direction angle is shown in the top plot in red. And that angle, it flips around by about 90 or 100 degrees. So what's going on there that's that the magnetic, so it's something where the magnetic field strength isn't changing, but the magnetic field is rotating. And at the same time is producing this spike in speed. And what we think is happening is that these spikes are what we've dubbed switchbacks. So the picture is that there's a very strong alphanic fluctuation coming from the sun. It's so strong that it produces this S-shaped bend in the magnetic field lines. The magnetic field lines are coming out straight or gently curved, they have a switchback in them. And so what happens then is that this fluctuation, this very large ripple in the magnetic field lines, is propagating out from the sun at the alphane speed. Then when the spacecraft passes through this structure, what does it see? Well, as it passes through, it sees the direction of the magnetic field suddenly change. And then because the fluctuation is propagating out in the frame of reference of the spacecraft, 
the speed of the plasma appears to double, up to double, uh, or excuse me, appears to increase at up to twice the alphane speed. And this seems to be consistent with what we're seeing. And we see many little ones, and we also see some big ones in the data. And they seem to be getting bigger as we get closer to the sun. So uh, I know I've been talking for a while, so I'll wrap up with just two slides kind of, I don't really have a conclusion for you because it's an ongoing mission. We're not done yet. And we're only really just scratching the surface with the amazing data we've already collected. But I just wanted to give you kind of an outlook going forward. Um, one of the things we're most interested in, I mentioned that these alphanic fluctuations uh, propagate uh, at a speed known as the alphane speed. And one of the more interesting things is, so the solar wind is not just supersonic, it's super alphanic. It's flowing out faster than the speed of these alphanic fluctuations. Um, and we're actually getting very close to the region where the solar wind is below the alphane speed. If you'll notice, these are plots showing data from Parker Solar Probe in Cyan and then the Helios mission in yellow. Uh, the top here is the solar wind speed in kilometers per second the, as a function of distance from the sun. The middle one shows the alphane speed. You'll notice it's getting higher and higher as you get closer to the sun because the density and the magnetic field are stronger as you get closer to the sun. So the way the alphanic fluctuations propagate faster. And then at the bottom plot is the alphane number. It's sort of like the Mach number, but it's the ratio of the solar wind speed to the alphane speed. And you'll notice that's getting really, really close. We're almost there at what's called the alphane point. The alphane point is the point where the outflow speed equals the alphane speed. And this defines the outer edge of the corona. And it's believed that this beneath here is where you get the bulk of the heating and the acceleration of the solar wind. And that's because you can have alphanic fluctuations propagating not only away from the sun, but reflected back toward the sun. And it's thought that those counter propagating fluctuations collide with each other, and that collision produces the heating that ultimately drives the solar wind. So we're on our way. Um, I'll just close with these key dates. So we had our third perihelion with the sun um, last fall, and then our second Venus account encounter on Boxing Day uh, toward the end of last year. We already have had our fourth perihelion, and we have just started our approach for the fifth perihelion, which will occur on June 7th. Uh, we will encounter Venus once again as we finish the fifth perihelion uh, for the third time in July and then achieve our sixth perihelion on September, in September of this year. Uh, Parker Solar Probe has already, with its first perihelion, I should say, broke the record for closest approach to the sun and fastest human-made object ever anywhere. It continues to break its own records. Uh, it will ultimately have seven Venus encounters, the last one in late November 2024, and nominally end of mission is uh, its 22nd perihelion, which will occur at the very end of, on Christmas Eve uh, in 2024, where it will be a mere 10 solar radii from the sun, less than 1 20th of the, um, of an AU and at a speed of, one, of over 190 kilometers per second. So I can really only leave you with the words of Gene Parker, let's see what lies ahead. So thank you so much. If you have any further questions, please let me know. We have two questions now. Okay. Uh, one of the questions that was just asked a minute ago is um, how is the temperature of the plasma measured? Uh, is it spectroscopic or is there some device like sensing the kinetic energy somehow because it's in it? It's kind of both. Um, because what you're doing is you're directly measuring the particles. So you can actually work out the energy distribution of the particles. And if you define temperature in a thermal way, right? So you have, if you think about temperature as how much 
the, the kinetic definition of temperature is it's how much the particles are wiggling around, right? So if all the particles are moving at exactly the same speed, or I should say the exact same velocity, then that's very cold, right? What matters is that when you're in the frame of reference of the plasma, how much variation is there? The hotter it is, the more the particles of gas are rattling around. So what you can do is you can actually, with a device like a Faraday cup or an electrostatic analyzer, measure the distribution of particle energies and just measure how wide it is. And what we usually end up doing is we fit a curve to it. So it's very similar. So it's essentially an energy spectrum. What we get out of those instruments is an energy spectrum, a distribution of particle energies and directions. And then if you want to read all the gory details of how you do that with a Faraday cup, you can read my thesis. Um, I spent a good number of years doing that with the wind spacecraft. Uh, one of NASA's older missions, it just had its 25th uh, Jubilee, um, which is quite old for a spacecraft. So, um, and I could go on at some length about that, so I will avoid that temptation. Um, but yeah, that's basically how you're doing it. There's uh, two other questions so far. How are counter propagations reflected back? Um, so it would probably, there are different theories of it, but it would probably be reflecting off of the inhomogeneity of the plasma. So you, if you, you wouldn't have counter propagation if it were just a nice smooth homogeneous material into which you put a single uh, fluctuation. But if you have different streams, for example, density gradients, you know, and you are going to have density gradients since at the very least it's expanding. Um, and not only that, you have different streams, those streams collide with each other, you have magnetic field lines reconnecting. Um, it is known that when you have counter propagating waves, that they will um, interact with each other nonlinearly and produce these dissipations. Another thing that can happen is if you have a magnetic field line that's a loop. Mm. So you have two outward propagating waves coming from opposite ends, and then they just interact with each other. Once you're past the Alfane point, the Alfane fluctuation, so the expansion, if the solar wind is expanding faster than the Alfane speed, that loop gets dragged out into deep space faster than the fluctuations can propagate. So once you're beyond the Alfane point, that particular mechanism of counter-propagating waves no longer happens. Those magnetic field lines essentially become open. Now there, there are no open magnetic field lines. Every magnetic field line must begin at a, at a North Pole and end at a South Pole. But it just means that that field line goes all the way out to the edge of the heliosphere before it comes back to the south pole of the sun. There was another one. Uh, could the switchbacks of the flux lines be an eddy in the lines? It is thought that they are connected to turbulence. Um, you know, we've been having, we're not exactly, there have been a few, there's, there was actually a paper not that long ago coming out that like you see that sort of structure produced by strong turbulence in a magnetized plasma in conditions similar to uh, those in the corona. So there, I think a lot of people are actually thinking that. Um, I would say that would be my guess that this is, that these switchbacks are not you know, where there's kind of a debate, like some people t seem to be thinking of them as sort of like some special process. They, I think that, you know, at least among the UD research group, our thinking is that they're just actually part of the turbulence, the extreme turbulence conditions in the solar, in the solar corona are producing these, um, these switchbacks, uh, these really sharp fluctuations in the, um, uh, and the plasma. Gotcha. I don't see any other questions. The only other things that are in the chat window, I think, are Star Trek references. Always, always welcome. I, I remember, 
uh, when we were in, when I took a uh, course in general relativity, we were studying um, uh, how you could actually create a little bubble of space, space time that could propagate faster than the speed of light, the warp drive metric, as we called it. Um, the author of the first study to do that, we couldn't figure out quite how to pronounce his name. And so the professor was like, well, let's just call it the Cochrane metric because that's what it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think you have to be a Star Trek nerd to be in this business. <laughs> There's another question that just popped up. How will the probe end? So um, rather ingloriously. So after the seventh Venus encounter, there won't be any more Venus encounters because now the aphelion, the point in its orbit farther, farthest away from the sun, will actually be inside of Venus's orbit. Right, so if you let me let's see, I will go back to oops. Well, that didn't work. Okay, let's go back to the orbit plot. So you'll notice right now the aphelion is just outside of Venus orbit with the finest final encounter the uh, aphelion will be just inside Venus orbit, so it won't be able to gravitationally interact with Venus again. Um, we, we call it a gravitational assist. It's really more of a gravitational desis since it's actually shedding angular momentum, giving it to Venus so it can tighten its orbit. Um, so it won't get any closer, even if we wanted it to. Now, as far as so now one thing that Parker, so now the mission can continue for some years, um, but we need to keep the heat shield pointed at the sun. Uh, in order to do that, we need to use fuel uh, to keep it pointed at the sun um, and to keep tracking the sun. And eventually it will run out of fuel. When Parker Solar Probe runs out of fuel, it can no longer point the heat shield at the sun. Um, it does have reaction wheels, but they can only go so fast. You have to ultimately dump that angular momentum somehow. It does that periodically through the expenditure of fuel. Once that fuel's gone and it can no longer point at the sun, uh, it's going to basically just melt. Oh. Um, I asked the project sci uh, the mission scientist for Parker Solar Probe, Nikki Fox, about this. Um, and you know, what happens if you lose pointing? And when you're at near perihelion, um, she said they have about 60 seconds. Uh, she's built a lot of spacecraft and she said this is by far the most automated spacecraft that has ever, um, that, they, that she's ever worked on or that the uh, applied physics lab at uh, Johns Hopkins has ever built. It basically has to take care of itself because when it's in, in encounter with the sun, it can't communicate with the earth because very often the sun is between the spacecraft and the earth. Mm. At the very least, things are too hot and it just can't be done. So it has to take care of itself, not to mention the light travel time. 60 seconds is a lot less than the time it takes for the signal to get from the spacecraft to Earth. So even if you are communicating with the spacecraft, by the time the signal gets to you, it's either fixed itself or melted apart. Oh. Near encounter with the sun, we do get um, what are called beacon tones. Um, what it can send is just a, it's, it's a, it, a single modulate, single frequency modulation on top of the carrier wave. Um, the all's clear is 11 hertz. That's the, okay, nothing, nothing went wrong. Nothing major went wrong, all's looking good. There's uh, a second tone, tone two, tone B, that says, hey, there were some major problems, just to let you know. And then tone C is, I don't know how I am still functioning as a spacecraft. This is a disaster. Um, so 
fortunately, we haven't seen Toad and Sea. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we don't want to see Toad and Sea. All right, I think that's all the questions. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, there's yeah, that popped up. I'd say at this point, why don't we go ahead and you know let people speak up and ask on their own. We'll see if this turns into utter chaos, but uh, it worked well last month. So yeah, at this point, if anybody has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and um, let's let's get this a little more casual. <clears throat> I'll ask the question I sent to to Rob, which was, uh, Ben, do you know anything about the uh, radio transmissions? Um, since the sun is radio quite noisy, being able mm -hmm. to out the signal from all the noise that the sun's generating? So picking out the signal from the, the noise that the sun's generating, that's a very, it's a very good question. Um, I think it's not too big of an issue. So you can't listen when you're very close to the sun. I mean, for one thing, you're using the massive satellite dishes of the DSN, which are nice and white and gleaming and you're going to be reflecting some visible light to your receiver, which would probably melt. Um, so you don't like to do that. Um, but you're right, it is, you know, the sun's a pretty powerful radio source, but the signal that you're looking for is a very specific frequency. So I'm assuming that what they, I, it's not too challenging in that regard. I'm assuming what they're using is um, a lock-in amplifier, essentially. Uh, well, no, I get, well, I guess it wouldn't be a lock-in amplifier, but they're looking for a very narrow range of frequency. So by applying a filter, because the sun's emissions are mostly broadband at radio frequencies. So they're able to look for the very specific channel that they want. Um, of course, applying appropriate Doppler shifts that they have to calculate since Parker Soy probe's moving pretty fast. So you do get some discernible Doppler shifts. Interestingly, the inverse of your question is also very interesting. Um, the spacecraft produces all sorts of radio frequencies that can easily swamp the signal from the sun, the radio waves in the plasma. So there are electric antenna, electrical antennas, radio antennas that, this, uh, that Parker Solar Probe is carrying, essentially big width antennas sticking out of the spacecraft. Um, so there are very strict protocols for electromagnetic cleanliness in order to measure those very relatively weak electric and magnetic fields in the plasma compared to the electric and magnetic fields that the spacecraft would generate. Um, for they make sure that there are only approved frequencies that your electronic devices, whatever they're doing on the spacecraft, science or um, operations equipment is allowed to use. This is everything from like the computer clocks to the clocks inside the memory. It's like, okay, you're allowed to use these specific frequencies so that they can cut them out of the data uh, more easily. They also have to make the spacecraft as demagnetized as possible. So the magnetic cleanliness. So they have to use materials that are demagnetized and won't become magnetized. And then they have to measure the magnetic, there's still some residual magnetic field in the spacecraft. And to do this, you, you wanna measure that residual field. And the easiest way to do this, and it's kind of dramatic, is called a swing test, where you power the magnetometers on while they're on the spacecraft. You lift the spacecraft up on a crane and then somebody, presumably one of the senior engineers, gives it a little push. So it starts swinging. And so the magnetic field of the spacecraft isn't going to be changing relative to those instruments, but the Earth's magnetic field is going to be changing direction because the spacecraft is moving. And, you know, I never asked Nikki, Nikki Fox about it, what it was like watching that. They have a video, uh, APL's website has a video of the swing test. And I'm just kind of, I have to imagine, like, it makes you a little nervous taking your billion dollar spacecraft and giving it a little push. <laughs> and you, you hope 
that you know you trust that you have the right people doing that they know what they're doing they're experts but still that's got to be a little nerve-wracking but yeah so it's actually the inverse of your problem of your question is also quite an interesting problem so trying to cut out all the noise that the spacecraft generates uh, electromagnetic noise in order to measure these relatively weak fluctuations Thank you for the thumbs up. And this is John, I have a question. Is there an advantage to having the mission run during a solar minimum? Um, not a particular one. Uh, it has been kind of advantageous in that the fluctuations are a little bit less and we are, you're seeing less extreme events. So it's made calibration a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get into too much of the history of Parker Solar Probe, but the Parker Solar Probe, actually the concept predates NASA. So before there was NASA, there was the Simpson Commission, which is a congressional commission put together to kind of say, well, it was in the 50s and it was like, well, we're losing the space race. We need to do stuff. What kind of mission should we do? And they put together like seven or eight different mission concepts. There was, let's go to the moon, and let's go to Venus, let's go to Mars, let's go to the outer planets. And they kind of ticked all those boxes over the decades, right? We had Voyager, we had the Mariner series, we had Pioneer, we had, you know. And, and then there was one, one that didn't, it was the last one. It was, let's go really close to the sun. And we kind of did it with Helios, but Helios only got to about a third of an AU and it was primarily European led. And it was like, well, we should really go a lot closer. Let's go into the Corona. That was the idea. Let's go into the atmosphere of the sun. And there were a lot of mission concepts. There were ones where it would go out to Jupiter and have a huge gravitational assist and actually fly into the sun uh, on a suicide mission. Uh, another mission concept was that it would have an ablative heat shield so the heat shield would burn away uh, during the encounter. Um, Parker Solar Probe could not have been launched a decade ago not because people didn't want to do it or didn't think it was a good idea. It, the technology simply was not there. These are extremely high-tech materials. Um, there are some top-notch thermal engineers who designed that heat shield um, and the other thermal support systems. Uh, the solar panels alone, because solar panels generate a ton of heat, they have a huge amount of surface area, so they actually have to be cooled. Um, there's a whole radiator system involved. There's water uh, being pumped through pipes to keep the, um, to help uh, bring the heat over from the heat shield to the radiators. Um, it's a very sophisticated system and it took years and years to develop. So um, in terms of an advantage to launching at solar minimum, I think everyone was just like, well, let's, Let's get it up there as soon as we can. Um, and I don't think anyone was really, even if there were some minor advantages to launching in terms of calibration, as I said, but even if there weren't, I don't think anyone wanted to wait any longer. It's been 60 years in the making. So everyone was really excited to get it up there as soon as possible and start learning uh, about the corona. Great, thanks. Well, um, Ken, do you want to ask your question? Hey, sure, it might be silly, but uh, I'm just curious if, if uh, there's any noticeable effect from time dilation when we're talking about 430 miles an hour or 430,000 miles an hour. Yeah, I guess you are getting a little, I mean, I guess in principle, you're getting some. Um, you know, it's still way below the speed of light. Um, my the rule of thumb that I've always heard is that you're not really getting into truly relativistic physics until you get to about a tenth of the speed of light, because there your uh, gamma factor would be, you know, your, you would start seeing it at the half percent level. 
uh, since the relativistic effects typically go as one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. So by the time you're at a tenth of the speed of light, you're looking at about a half percent correction. Um, and so probably, you know, and, and tenth of the speed of light, so uh, the speed of light is three times 10 to the five kilometers per second. Um, and Parker solar probes go, and even the solar wind is going at three times 10 to the two kilometers per second. So you're still comfortably below there. Um, I don't know of any relativistic corrections that they make uh, off the top of my head. Uh, they, it might actually be comparable to the gravitational time dilation that occurs from going closer to the sun. Um, I know that you have to make relativistic corrections for GPS systems, for example, because there you're relying on nine or 10 digit precisions in time in your position measurements. And one of the things I remember being very surprised by when I took my aforementioned course in general relativity is that the general relativistic correction for, B, for the spacecraft being higher in the potential well than you are on the surface is about twice as large as the special relativistic correction for their orbital speed. That I, I was very surprised by. I figured that the special relativistic correction would be dominant and it's actually, they're comparable, but the general, the gravitational correction is bigger than the speed correction. So I don't know of any correction they're making in terms of like the transmission. I'd be a little surprised if it was a big one, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. I've not heard of any. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have a question from either Anthony or Terry. Do one of you want to ask? Um, and well, the question was, Ben, have you heard of the Ulysses spacecraft and have, or have you used any of its data? I, I have actually used a little bit of Ulysses data. I've certainly encountered it in papers and I'm starting to play around with it. Um, Ulysses was a really interesting mission. It was another wide ranging, it had a pretty wide range of coverage in terms of radial distance. Um, I believe it went all the way out to Jupiter to get this very, um, it went way out of the ecliptic plane uh, to try to really get a polar view of uh, the sun. And that's sort of, you can kind of think of solar orbiter as a hybrid of Helios, the Helios mission, and Ulysses, because it will also get not quite that far out of the ecliptic plane, but it'll get pretty far out of the ecliptic plane. Uh, the polar regions of the sun are actually one of the least well studied. And it's simply because when you're on Earth or anywhere in the ecliptic plane, you don't get a good view of the poles. It's, you know, kind of edge on and you don't get to see all that much. And increasingly, it's becoming clear that there's a lot of dynamics that we about the sun overall that we can learn by observing the poles, um, especially since the sunspot cycle seems to be kind of a pole to equator evolution. That it, the solar cycle begins with sunspots forming toward the poles and kind of migrating down. So there's some interest in space weather prediction in looking at the polar regions and just understanding the overall dynamics of the solar cycle. Um, but yeah, Uly Ulysses data, uh, the data from Ulysses are really quite unique. I should say that people are still using these data from Ulysses, from Voyager, um, from Pioneer, from all of these spacecraft. Um, and a lot of them are available publicly uh, on a resource, a resource called CETAWEB, C-D-A-W-E-B. If you search for NASA CETAWEB, um, they're all available there, uh, some with varying levels of documentation. Um, but they're all reasonably well documented, so you can get time series of magnetic field data, uh, particle data, uh, electric field data, energetic particle data, depending on the mission. Uh, the older missions, not all of those data have been fully posted and documented. 
Um, but Parker Solar Probe data, they're required to be posted six months after each encounter is fully downloaded. So the team fully downloads the data set. They have six months to uh, clean it up, calibrate it, and then post it with full documentation. And so sorry, that was my question. I think are now available to you. I'm sorry? I said, I'm sorry, that was my question. I couldn't unmute myself fast enough about Ulysses. Ah, okay, yes. So yeah, I mean, uh, I have actually started playing around with them, trying to compare Parker Solar Probe to other spacecraft. Um, it doesn't line up particularly well with Ulysses data, uh, primarily because it was out of the ecliptic so, by so far. And so that really is a very unique data set. It's given us a lot of unique insights. But yeah, that's a great, it was a great mission. Cool. Um, so Bill McKibben has a question. Given that you're very knowledgeable about the sun, he's wondering what SPF sunscreen would you recommend? <laughs> I would say, Kidding, I Bill don't want to block the sun. Bill did not ask that question. <laughs> Why would I want to block the sun? SPF zero, please. All well, right. Million. <laughs> now, if you don't want to get skin cancer, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's not me. <laughs> it, I, I have never known a spacecraft to get skin cancer. I'm just saying. Got it. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> going once, going twice. I think that's it, Jeff. Well, Ben, I want to thank you again for giving a very interesting talk. Um, I hope I didn't drone on too long. No, no, no. That was that was no, perfect. No, no um, that was. A... That, I'm not sure. I was again. I've been scratching my head. I'm not sure we've had a really good in-depth talk on the sun. Um, but I don't think we've had a bad one. I don't think we've had really any talks on the sun. So that was kind of cool and uh, filled an interesting niche. So, get definite big thanks. Um, maybe again we'll do a little experiment. If here, if everyone wants to unmute themselves, we can give Ben a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> really was a pleasure. Thank you so much. So ben, thanks for yes. again being um, flexible and willing to do this with the change of data as well as willingness to do it over Zoom. Um, I, I think it's very meaningful and important to all of us that we do have this somewhat semblance of normalcy in, um, in some interesting times. So extra appreciated for your willingness to step in and do this for us. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, yes. I, I completely agree. Um, I was just telling my, I had my last lecture of the semester yesterday and I was just telling my students that, that, you know, um, I hope that, I hoped I was able to provide them some measure of normalcy because having my lectures to give gave me some sense of normalcy. Yeah. Awesome. You know, mm -hmm. Thank you for having me here. It really was a pleasure. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you, really good. Fascinating. Yes. I just want to thank welcome. everyone for again participating for again being right. flexible using Zoom as well as all the great questions. Um, certainly encourage people to join us next week for our astronomy workshops and um, stay tuned for whatever program we will be doing third week of June. So <laughs> hope to see everybody again soon. Have a great night, everyone. You too. Thank you. Yeah. Great to see Good everybody. Night. Good night. Bye all. Good night. Bye.